do for you tonight is really give you a different perspective on senior living. Because let's face it, senior living, I've been in this business for 24 years. The magazine that Seth was talking about, I started it when I was in college because my grandfather was in a nursing home. And I realized my family didn't have a resource to find all the different senior communities for my grandfather. And uh, so for 24 years, I've had people telling me, I'm not ready yet. Oh, oh, I told my mom she's never going to move to one of those places. Just go ahead and keep that magazine. There, I've seen this resistance for 24 years. And that's one of the reasons why I did the experiment that Seth is talking about. Really to try to get to the bottom of what are some of the elements of resistance? You know, what makes these places a place that somebody might not want to move. I was surprised by the results. I'll share them with you today. Um, but before I do, I want to sort of give you my different perspective on aging, uh, uh, a little glimpse at a different perspective on aging. Now first, I love this lady right here. Um, the, uh, I, I, I use her in most of my presentations, and I talk all over the place. A lot of times I'll talk at a senior center. When I first started using this photograph, I said, you know, here we have this woman, she's doing something that none of us in the room can do. And uh, this, this lady in the back row raises her hand, she goes, no, I can do that. And, uh, and then she proceeded to do that. And uh, she got a standing ovation. But, but really, the, you know, what I want to do today for you all is really give you a different perspective, really encourage you to think about this life transition, whether it be for yourself, for your next door neighbor, for your loved one, think about it outside the box. Really, you know, erase everything that you heard before and really look at this as uh, an exciting and positive life transition. So, one of my mantras is everyone is aging, okay? Now, in current day society, this is not true because in current day society, these two ladies with the gray hair and the wrinkles are aging, but these little kids here are aging, okay? We use the word aging incorrectly in our vocabulary. Aging begins on the delivery room table. Uh, when you're born, you begin aging, okay? But the way we use the word aging is aging begins when you get the ARP card, when you can't get up and down the stairs, when you can't drive at night, I'm aging. Oh, geez, I'm aging. I mean, you go to every barbecue, you know, this weekend, and you're going to hear people bitching about aging. You know? <laughs> but, but meanwhile, we're all aging at the exact rate of time. And so what is the opposite of aging? Unfortunately, it's a billion-dollar business called anti-aging, okay? Um, and this is anti-aging, you, you know. But, but let me go back to this, uh, let me go back to this photo. The, these are my, th these two ladies here are my new spokesmodels. Um, they are the uh, stars of a um, ad campaign that, that uh, ran in the UK for Dove Cosmetics. Um, and on her headline, it said, Gray Gorgeous. And on her headline, it said, Wrinkled Wonderful. Now, <clears throat> we don't see ads like this in America yet. Uh, hopefully someday we will. Um, but what I love doing is I sort of say, well, geez, you know, and I'll ask you guys. It's sort of like, these ladies are ugly, right? I mean, because she could dye her hair a different color, couldn't she? And, and she could get a good plastic surgeon to smooth out all those wrinkles, you know. So you no know, one ever says they're ugly. Uh, but but what what do you think makes these two ladies beautiful? Their spirit, their spirit, their heart, their smile. I heard their smile, and I think I heard their eyes somewhere. I I, I think you know their spirit, their smile, their eyes. That's what makes them beautiful. So if you learn nothing from me tonight, the, the next time you hear somebody complaining about growing older and looking in the mirror and saying, oh, I got all these wrinkles. It's sort of like, you want to erase all that? Put a big smile on your face, you know. And I'm going to talk about 
how we can get that smile on our face and that gleam in our eyes. It's called living with purpose. It's having a purpose in life. And it's not easy. It really isn't. I'm going to sort of go over some things, um, especially when we start going through these life transitions. But, but that's, that's the secret to quote unquote looking young. But there is no way you can't reverse aging. It's, we're all growing older at the same time. So, so the opposite of that are these two ladies, you know, and here you got, she's, she doesn't have gray hair anymore, but she's got this scowl on her face. And then, I swear to God, when I look at this, the old Joan Rivers looks way more beautiful than, than this person. You know, and you sort of wonder, like, who are you fooling? Why is, you know, and, and this, this has a much bigger effect, you know, again, I know this is not, you know, the type of discussion you're thinking about today, but see, we need to eliminate this anti-aging philosophy that's out there to, to make this, uh, our, our community embrace the elders better, you, you know, and it's going to happen, I know it is, because we had the, uh, we just had the Civil Rights March and, you know, we got ERA, what, one of the women, does anybody remember Betty Fernand? Uh, I, I had the good fortune of interviewing Betty Friedan when she lived in an assisted living community. I'll share a little bit about that with you uh, before I'm done. Okay, and I'm jumping all over the place here, but um, what I, what, uh, before I, I move into just telling you my story about why I moved into these communities and what I learned, um, I, I don't want to leave here unless I can solve some of your problems. You know, so, one of the things that, that would be really good for me, are there any sort of issues that are related to aging or senior living or downsizing or just issues that you guys have that you might want me to address in my presentation today? Any sort of headaches or challenges that you're faced with, with these types of issues or your loved ones? You can hit me up in yes, Getting rid of all your stuff. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you guys a great tip on that one. Uh, so don't let me stop talking unless I uh, unless I get to that one. Any other kind of uh, issues that might creep up? You know, you bring up a really uh, interesting topic, and this is a big topic: is downsizing and making the transition from that home that we've lived in for all those years to this new home, it might be a little bit more unfamiliar and it might look a little different. Just out of curiosity, by a show of hands, has anybody lived in the same home for 10 years or more? Okay. How about 20 years or more? Okay, we still got some hands up. Okay, uh, 30 years or more? But wow, 30 years, 30, oh, we got 30. Okay, okay, 40 years or more. Anybody in the room, 40 years? We got one here, one over here. Any more, more 40 years or more? So how many years have you lived in? 45, can you beat 45? 53. Hey, let's get, what, what's your name? Linda. Linda, let's give Linda a big round of applause. Seth, I hope you can hook Linda up with something. Uh, you know, I, I forgot to bring prizes, so I didn't think it. Well, now we know why Linda asked that question. Yeah. Okay, because I don't care if you've lived in the same home for five years. It's hard to think about that downsizing and that moving process. So I'll make sure to address that um, in my presentation. And what I would say is, you know, I want this to be interactive. I want you guys to walk away with something. So if at any point in my presentation, an idea comes up or a challenge comes up, just raise your hand. I'd like to address it, okay? Okay, so here's the, Seth sort of gave me the little intro in that I, I was regarded as this expert in the Mid-Atlantic on senior housing, but I had never spent one night in a senior community. I'd been, I'd visited over 500 communities. I'd interviewed thousands of people for the articles in our magazine. I had, I knew about the issues of downsizing. I knew about a lot of this stuff, but it's sort of like 
what I realized was it was sort of like working in a restaurant but not eating a meal there. It's sort of like, how can I objectively help these folks if I haven't been in their shoes? And now, it, you know, of course, people looked at what's like, well, Steve, you're 43 years old. Uh, you know, it's not your time yet, you know. So what my thought was, it's sort of like, well, wait a second. Why should this, these communities just be a place for old folks or people with disability? And wouldn't it be a great test to say, if this is good enough for a 43-year-old who's active and healthy, that, you know, of course it's going to be better for the rest of the community. So I was at a client, came up with this idea, I was at a client meeting, and uh, I, I work at all these, with a lot of these places, and, I, and they asked me a question, they asked my opinion on something, one of the services that they were offering to the residents. And I said, well, you know, sounds like a good idea, but how about you let me move into your community for a while, and then maybe I could give you a little bit of a better perspective. And their, their response was, well, why would you want to do that? You know? And one of the things that was shocking is, is when I started to announce, I, when I started telling people that I was going to do this, is that a lot of the people that worked in the communities were like, oh, geez, better you than me. You know? And I was sort of like, well, that's not very good. You know? I mean, here you are working in these communities. This, just like if, it, if this was a restaurant, you'd want to eat a meal here, you, you know? So I started going about the process of my first move, which was to a community in, the, in suburban northern Virginia. And even though this was going to be a pretend move, I wanted to, to try to replicate the experience the best that I could. So a few weeks before I was moving in, um, this is a photo of me filling out the paperwork to move into the community. And what blew me away was, I had helped many of these communities create these applications, but it never dawned on me to like fill it out with my own name and address. And what I realized when I did that was the amount of anxiety that one feels when you're doing something like this. It's a very stressful process. I mean, and um, the, uh, so, so that was me filling out the application, and, and one of the things that I've counseled uh, my readers, many of who are, which are helping their mom and dad make this transition, is, you know what, when your mom is filling out that application, grab a blank one and say, Mom, I'm going to fill this out with you right next to you here. It, it might make her feel a little bit better, but it will also help sort of put you in the right frame of mind, that this is not an easy transition for somebody to make. So then the next thing that I'm taking here, I, it, it, it's a funny little thing, and I don't know what, how things are in Massachusetts, but uh, that is uh, a little test that I had to take called the mini mental exam. Do you, do you guys have to take that here in, in Massachusetts? So, okay. And I had to take the mini mental exam, and uh, you know, even though Seth and I are just a few years out of graduate school, boy, when people tell me I got to take an exam and a woman comes in a white coat, it, it made me kind of nervous too. Um, but uh, the uh, but but the last photo is me in the dining room with some of the residents, and and this is was really the cool thing that I learned about making all these transitions is is that what I say is is that. I've lived in a lot of neighborhoods my, in my lifetime, but these five communities that I lived in temporarily are the best neighborhoods I ever lived in. That the, the camaraderie that I saw between the residents and between me and the residents was way better than I, I, what I see on my idealistic suburban neighborhood. You know, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but, but let me let me give you a few things and we'll, we'll kind of back into the downsizing issue. But I think, uh, I think activities came up uh, earlier when, when Seth was talking. So my, here I am, I, I thought I was prepared for this, but I move into this community and the only person I knew was the marketing director. You know, and I'm this, you know, I'm the different guy. It's like, well, what, you know, they're looking at me, why would anybody want to do this, you, you know, and, and I'm the young guy, and I felt pretty alone and isolated, but they lead me up to my apartment, and uh, 
Well, you know what? I'm going to back up. I'm going to tell that story a second. I'm going to talk about before I moved in. So I took the, I took the mini mental, I took the application. I, they showed me the apartment that I was going to be living in. And what I realized was is that when I had toured all those 500 communities for the last two decades, that I never really looked in an apartment like I was going to be living there. So this was the first time that now, instead of you know somebody showing me an apartment and, and oh, nice granite countertops, oh, that's really nice. Now it's sort of like, well, where are my toiletries going to go here in the, in the um, in the bathroom? And let's see, I think my couch might fit there. It it really came home that I was very detached when I was touring all these communities. And this is one, again, another thing that I try to share with the adult children that might be helping mom and dad make these transitions is that you really need to immerse yourself in this decision and try not to look at it from an arm's length. Try to get in your mom and dad's shoes. So one of the things, because I knew downsizing was such a big issue, is that when I went back home that night, and I had plenty of stuff to tell my wife uh, after that experience, one of the things, I, since this was a temporary move, I wasn't going to be taking our personal possessions because she'd really have me on that one. But what I did was I went through our house and I made a list of everything in our three-bedroom, two-car garage house. It took, took all day, but I really wanted to really feel this, this, this process. And then I took my one bedroom floor plan and I tried to figure out what items of furniture, what possessions would I be taking with me on this move. Well, no surprise, uh, we have a lot of junk that we don't use in our house. I mean, that, that number one came home. It, it turned out that I would take 19 items of furniture, okay? And big surprise, they're the items of furniture we use almost every day in our daily life. And that's one of the reasons why I really wanted to take them. You know, that couch that I sleep, that I sleep on, that I pass out on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think my wife was going to have me sleeping on the couch. But, but I told her I wanted her to move into one of these with me. But, uh, the, but, but so, and, and what we did was um, I, I documented all this on a blog. So. Um, I did this little thing. I had my wife, once I figured out what I was taking, then I walked around the house and I, I had my wife videotape me while I described what I was going to take. Well, we're in the kitchen and I, you know, figured out what I was going to take. I go, okay, honey, turn on the camera. And I meant to say, of course I'm going to take the coffee pot. But what I said was, of course I'm going to take the crock pot. <laughs> All right? So she goes, did you mean that? I go, no, nah, not really, but let's just get it over with. So I put that up on the blog. The next morning, I get all these comments. Steve, you don't need a crock pot in a retirement community. You know you can get a one-person crock pot. You know, why aren't you taking your coffee pot? You, you know, like all these things. And there, I learned two valuable lessons in doing that. Number one, the videotape or photographs are this awesome way to preserve the memory of our home. So like, the, you know, so one thing that I tell my readers is, if you're thinking about transitions like this, or even if you're not, videotape your home as it is now and tell the story of your dining room table. Tell the story of your backyard or that armoire or these possessions that we have that mean so much to us. What you're doing there is you're not only preserving those memories for you later on, uh, but for many generations to come, you, you know, great-grandchildren you've never met can stick this in the uh, whatever they have in 2030 um, and see grandma talking about her home and what have you. But the real lesson that I learned with the Crock-Pot is how important impractical items are in our life, okay? So, <clears throat> what I realize is I don't need that crock I shouldn't take that crock pot to a retirement community, but what going through this process made me realize how important that crock pot is to me. We only use that crock pot twice a winter, but it makes the house smell so good that I love seeing it on my counter all year long. And so, yes, I shouldn't be taking that with me. It's not that 
it's not a practical item, but it does have an important, it plays an important part in my house being a home. So my solution to something like that is that, you know, when the day comes that my wife and I downsize and I have to go to the two-person house, at the end of the day, it's a lot easier for me to go down to Giant or Safeway and get a nice hot cup of soup there uh, than, you know, uh, putting all the stuff in the big crock pot. So, so from, the, from the downsizing, from the 53 years of living in the home, or five years, one of, the, one of the fun activities, and it's a great gift to your family, is taking photos of, of this. So many times when we create scrapbooks, we take photos of events. We don't think about scrapbooking items. And when we do take pictures of items, it's for insurance purposes, okay? What I, it's very easy, and, and I've got a realtor that does this now. Whenever she lists somebody's home that lived there for over 20 years, she goes, don't move a thing. And she just holds the video camera and she just walks around while the residents, the, the homeowners, talk about everything in that house. And um, one of the first times she did this, it was awesome. The, uh, she turns off the video camera and the, the homeowner, she goes, "Hun, I want you to give me 20 copies of that. She goes, because I'm sending it to every one of my kids and my grandkids. And, and I'm getting rid of every single thing in this house. I'm going to have them watch that videotape and tell me what they want, and, and the rest of it's going. Because when my husband was alive, he never let me get new furniture. And this time, I'm going to get all new furniture. <laughs> well, here's the funny thing about what she did at the new community. She moved in. She had this big four-bedroom house, and she moved into the smaller retirement community. The, the interior designer that worked with her, she goes, Everything looked exactly like the old furniture. <laughs> but the beauty of it was it was brand new and it was on a smaller scale. If you look at a lot of our furniture, it's on the scale for a three to four bedroom home, not a one bedroom apartment. So that wind back chair is taking up a lot more space and it doesn't need to be that big. And that's why I say, I don't care what retirement community you talk about in the country, there's a 12-foot armoire crammed into an 8-foot space, and there's socks in the drawers. You know, it's because of the memories of that of that that item. And this is not an easy process. I, I'm glad to see that a whole. Do, do you guys have senior move managers up here? Yes. They're they're great. I mean, that's a great profession. It, that might even be something to have like speakers on it, some of your series because they they have great ideas. So. Okay, so that's the downsizing. So now, now let me get back on track to my first day in this community. So they get me in and I'm like, holy cow, I don't know what I'm gonna do here. There's a knock on the door, the one person that I know, marketing director, she knocks on, she goes, hey Steve, y'all moved in, you know, yeah, yeah. She goes, well, I thought you might like this. This is the activity camp here. And, um, I, and she goes, and they have uh, Wii Bowling in, in 15 minutes, you might want to go down there. We figured you'd like to do that. And I looked at this activity calendar and go, okay, I'm going down there. I'm going to get through this week. I'm just going to go to every single one of these things. This is going to make it make it work for me. I just got to stay busy. I got to, you, you know, I, I can't just sit here in the room. And I want to be, I want to be a resident of this place. You, you know, so this is what I got to do. So I go down to Wee Bowling, and that was great. And then from Wee Bowling. It was trivia, and this was on a Tuesday. I always remember this because I'm in this trivia game, and it's me and three women named Mary. Okay. <laughs> so in the current generation of ladies that live in a retirement community, half of them are, are named Mary. Um, so, so me and the three Marys are playing trivia, and um, it, was, it, it was almost like uh, it was a scripted event because the, the staff member would call out the question and they'd all turn to this Mary because they knew she was going to answer that question about, you know, post-1940. And then if it was a, a popular culture question, it was this Mary over here. And if it had anything to do with, you know, uh, World War II, it was this Mary over here. Well, I, number one, I don't think I answered one question in the trivia game before any of the Marys. But I stopped the game like five or six times because they would answer the question, they would throw in a personal tidbit of information, and it just intrigued me so much. It's like, wait, what are you talking about? 
and uh, they'd explain themselves, but they were all ready to go back into the game, you know. But it was an awesome experience for me, and, and, it, and a life-changing one, because what it made me see, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, is that we we helped each other in that um, in that game. I I asked these questions over that week. I got three books from those ladies, and well, one gave two books, and one told me about a PBS special that's going to be on. Uh, you know, so me being in that game, me being the outsider in that game, I had tons I could learn from these ladies, and it was way better than when I was in history class in high school, and. What they had was I gave them purpose. Now they had a new purpose. Instead of just having fun and playing the game, now they had the opportunity to teach me something, and I was a willing recipient. And so I make this joke that I could drop my kids off. They are 7 and 10. I could drop them off at any retirement community in this country and let them walk around for a semester with no lesson plan or anything and they'd be more educated than the most elite private school. <laughs> and it's not all the residents would jump in on this, but I know there are enough that would make it their purpose to say, hey, you, you know, let me show you some stuff. You, you know, and it really speaks to the, the way that we try to teach people. And what all I have said since I went through that experience is, man, if somebody had just stuck me in a retirement community and had me moderate a bingo game when I was in high school, I might have gotten better grades. <laughs> so, my kids don't like to hear this stuff. They'll be, they'll be the same so, so, so being part of the community was, was really one of the valuable lessons that I learned. But after making these moves, and in all total, I, did, I, I went to five different communities. I'll give you a, a little snapshot of that, but I want to kind of skip ahead to what, what did I walk away with and what can you guys walk away with in terms of, you know, a different way of looking at things. Is, is that in, in our business, this aging business, this senior living business, we, a lot of times you begin to start, start thinking that the service that we're selling you is, oh, transportation, or Meals on Wheels, or mobility products, or something like that. But really what, we're, what we are selling and what we need as an industry to focus on is living life with purpose regardless of age or ability. Now, when we're healthy and when everything's great, this is not a problem. You know, if you can jump in your car and go to the country club and play around the golf, and that gives you purpose in life, hey, no big deal. But if you throw your back out, and all of a sudden, that one thing that you really cherish deeply is more difficult to, to process, all of a sudden, you have a declining level of purpose, okay? Now, disability has nothing to do with age. So for example, you guys probably can't I, I'm limping a little bit because I had uh, knee surgery last Friday. Number one, surgeons are great these days. I'm that I'm <laughs> up here walking around. But I had, I'm going through a period of temporary disability. And, you know, some of the things that I like to do that give me purpose, ride a bike, you, you know, go jogging, can't do that anymore. It would be really easy for me to say, life is over, can't do those things, you know, I give up. But there are millions of things for me to do out in the world and to experience. And, and part of what our job is, I think, in our industry, is helping people expand this horizon. And it's one of the things that really happens in communities like All American and the, the communities that I work with. Because you've got such an exciting cross-section of residents with such varied interests. And you've got staff that's there to also facilitate uh, this, but there, there are three things that make this stool tip over that were really emphasized when I made these moves into the communities. The first is getting around. Okay, in in the business we call this transportation. But I don't say to my wife, "Honey, we need to get into the transportation vehicle to get to the kids' soccer game." It, you know, we use some terms like getting around or "Hey, we're going to go over here." So. Most of the people that I ran into that lived with me in these communities were there because they lived in the suburbs, 
they were rather car dependent, and they either didn't want to drive or they couldn't drive anymore, so they chose to move to the community. One of the best examples was a lady sitting next to me on the weekly uh, um, grocery store trip. And uh, she and I were in the van and we're, we're sitting there and she comes in, she had a walker, a mobility device, and she said, son, I love it here. I, I moved here from New Jersey to be close to my daughter. But, you know, when I was, where I lived in New Jersey, I could walk to the grocery store um, every day. And I wish that this community was just close enough so I could walk to the grocery store. And it dawned on me, I was like, wow, you, you know, I didn't really realize how important grocery stores are. But when you get right down to it, the grocery store is a place that I, me and my family, we almost go there every day. But it also made me realize just how, you know, car dependency and transportation dependency, how critical that is to us maintaining our purpose in life. And so, um, uh, that's, that's one thing, that, that's a very important thing, and it's an important component because if we transition into a place like All-American, there's a transportation solution for us there. Um, one of the challenges is, one of the, the way legislation would like to have it go is, is that, hey, you know, when you're, uh, when you get too old to drive, we've got this great senior ride program taxi voucher program, and there's been studies that have shown if you haven't used public transportation in your younger years, it's going to be very difficult to start using that in your 60s, 70s, and 80s, you know. So what I tell folks when I talk to them is, if you think you, down the road, if you didn't have your car, you might be using public transportation, start playing around with it right now, you know. So the second element that can tip the stool over to maintaining purpose is accessible environments. And again, the DC area is very similar to, to this area where we've got a lot of colonial style homes. You know, it's uh, not very often when you see a first floor master bedroom in any home in our community. And when folks decide that they, if they have an issue that makes it more difficult, you know, many times, they're not necessarily living at home with as much dignity as they would like because they didn't do those remodeling projects to make that first floor master suite. Um, and again, this is another solution that is oftentimes solved by, you know, a place like All American. But the last leg of the, st the stool, and it's my favorite, is neighborhood connections. So. You guys, have, because you're near, you're near Boston with Beacon Hill, you've no doubt heard the term aging in place, right? Okay, now, and, and I've been an advocate for, for stuff like that for many, many years, but one of the things that I think the aging in place community is missing is, is that you can get services to people's homes. I mean, you can get transportation, you can modify somebody's home, you can get um, meals delivered, a variety of things. But if that person isn't a part of the neighborhood and part of the fabric of that community, then it's not necessarily the greatest place to age in place. And one of the things that I've been advocating for is to help bridge that generational wall. We should, in our neighborhoods, have young and old helping each other and, and sharing and, and, uh, and, and things like that. But it doesn't always happen. But where I did see it happen was in these five neighborhoods that I spent time in, these five communities. And this blew me away because, like I said, I've been to over 500 communities. I helped them all with their marketing materials. And I, you know, was an advocate that the best staff is very important, you, you know, training and all this stuff. And, it, and I still think it's very important is the staff of a community. But what I missed was how much the, the residents care for each other and take care of each other in, in, um, in caring ways, but then in just trivial and emotional ways as well. If, uh, you know, if somebody drops a, uh, the newspaper and they can't bend over to pick it up, it's not an RN that comes running around the corner to help them pick it up. It's generally one of their neighbors, you know. And so 
this was real exciting to me, and, and a real exciting revelation. What I realized was, you know, the two ladies that, eat, that bicker with each other every night at dinner, and, and to an outsider, it's like, gosh, they don't really like each other that much. I think they, they care about each other more than me and my neighbors do. And I live on one of these streets, you know, it's like nice, nice lawns, and everybody waves to each other, and we're nice to each other. But it's not a deeper level of caring that I see in these communities. And, and I've interviewed a lot of people that have, have moved to communities and have been in the first wave of residents. And I think, you know, it's always exciting to me to see the pioneering group, the first group that moves in. There's only going to be one first group that moves into this community. And that's going to set the tone for generations to come. You know, and so that's that's a really cool thing. So this is my three-legged stool here, and it's um, but the, the key thing is is you know to try to take the aging out of this, try to take the senior living. I'm not as good as I used to be. Uh, you know this, that, and the other, and and frame it in that this is an exciting period of time. I've got the opportunity to reinvent my purpose in life. And there's tons of purpose in life. So, so uh, and I'm gonna wrap up here pretty soon. Uh, definitely give me the hook when you want, when you need me to, Seth. But in my community, I got started on trying to create a Beacon Hill-like community in, in Northern Virginia. And I was all excited. This is back in early 2000s. And uh, I was at Starbucks and I was telling one of my friends about this, and she goes, well, you tell me when you get that started, because I'm really interested. And I said, well, do you, I didn't know you had a parent living with you. This, uh, I didn't realize that. She goes, no. She goes, Steve, I'm a single mom with three kids. He, she goes, everything you're talking about that that group would do would be of value to me, and I would love to hook up with some of the seniors in our neighborhood that are living alone because we could really share a lot of resources. And it, it really was just, I couldn't believe that I had missed that after all these years, the, the benefit of the single mom and you know, the seniors connecting. There's so many ways that people can serve each other and find a purpose. So, um, so I did my first move. And, and I, you guys, I realized that I, um, I, I, I realized too, all the residents, when I was getting ready to leave, they're like, what are you going to do next? And I said, well, you know, guys, I'm, I do have a family, but I'm living here as a single guy, you know, which is, you know, if you're a single guy living in a retirement community, the odds are in your favor. <laughs> <laughs> but I said, you know, I'm going to see if I can get my family to move into one of these communities, you know, and see what that's like. You know, I, was, I had such a great time that week. And, and I couldn't convince my wife to do that, but it was summer break, and so my, my son was going to, um, he, he thought it would be cool to go and, and stay in a community with me. But I also chose a downtown community. It was in downtown D.C., so we wouldn't be as car dependent as we were when we were living in the, um, uh, the, the community that was in the suburbs. So before I moved into the community, I said to Asa, that's his name, um, I said, uh, how do you feel about going to a retirement community with dad? He was like, oh, that's great, you know. And, and I tell people, you tell a six-year-old that they're going to prison with their dad, they're going to be happy. <laughs> but then I said, hey, what is a retirement community? And he goes, uh, well, you have to think about it. And he goes, well, it's a place you're lost and you need a place to live and you move to a retirement community. You know, I was like, wow, that's kind of interesting. So now, this is at the end of our stay, and he's telling his little sister what a retirement community is. Hopefully, you can, um, I think the speaker is
So uh, I know you couldn't really hear that that well, but but, but basically what he, what he was saying is, it, first off, after a couple of days, I said, now I said, what's a retirement community? He goes, it's a place you go to meet other people. Because he had never met this many people in his entire life. He was getting a little sick of it, too. You know, um, right on. But the interesting thing is, he never, like when we went in there, he didn't really know retirement communities are for people over a certain age. But every time we'd get into the elevator, they would say, the residents would say, how are you holding up with this old people? You, you, you know. And so what he was saying to his sister is, we're showing how young and old people can live together. And, you know, I mean, yeah, uh, young and old people have always lived together. You, you know, so it was, it was a really interesting process. But it was also, I discovered another thing. is that when I moved in and I had him with me, I had somebody that I had to take. And so I felt I had per I had a purpose, you know. So all the anxiety that I felt when I was by myself, um, even though this was the second time I was doing this, because I was focused on him, it was it, that helped me. And so, like one of the things that I've told many of our readers is, you, you know, if you can bring a pet, a plant, something, you know, that you can take care of, that can. You know, a fish, you know, it can really make a difference, especially in that beginning transition. Since the video isn't, uh, the audio isn't is that good, I should have brought my speaker. The, the next video that I have here, I, I wanted to share with you because I've never heard anybody talk in such a positive manner about the transition to senior living than this man. This is uh, Grant Bagley. And Grant was a high school dropout. Okay, he grew up in Utah. He dropped out of high school to be a ski bum. And fortunately for Grant and for us, he injured, his, he injured himself and um, his dreams of being a ski bum were derailed. But then this high school dropout goes and he gets his uh, law degree and his, his uh, medical degree. So he's a doctor and a lawyer. And he and his wife live in a retirement community, okay? Now, what he's talking about in this video, and I, I can send links to all these to, um, to Seth and he can share them with you. What he's talking about in this video is he's talking about the first time that his kids are going to see him and his wife in the retirement community. And he says, you know, when you uh, come here, you're not going to like what you see because you're going to see us with a bunch of people that you think are older than us, that are, that are more frail than us, that, uh, and you don't want to see me and mom in that situation. She, and, and he goes, but listen to me, I want to tell you one thing. Those people are our friends. And number two, me and mom could be that way sometime. And so he said, when you look at this place, I want you to look at your mom and I want you to see if she's happy. And that's all you should be judging this place on. And I, I, I always start crying every time I, 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 I hear him say this, but and, and he, he says, you know, his son said he's never seen his mom that happy. And a lot of what he also talks about is being in this huge house that they loved, but it took a week to clean up. And now they, they have the ability to clean up in an afternoon and go visit the grandkids or go, you know, do what they want to do. Um, a side note, that photo, Grant's in a wood shop. Um, the, the community has a little wood shop. When, when, he, when he moved to this community, he decided he was going to have to, because, hey, I'm moving to a retirement community, I have to give up some of my hobbies. One was woodworking, okay? Well, he discovered that he could bring his best tools here and contribute to the wood shop. But the other one that he definitely said, I'm giving this up, was ham radio, all right? It's like, no way, I don't need it, I'm going to have enough of other stuff to do. Well, he gets there, and he starts, as he's talking to people that he's meeting, he's discovering that there's other people that liked ham radio when, when they lived back home. And so they decide to form the ham radio club. All right? So now, um, Grant, uh, Grant is uh, walking down a hallway one day, and somebody calls out his name. And he's right near the nursing home section of the, the community. And 
this gentleman in a wheelchair says, are you Grant Badley? He goes, he goes, yeah. He goes, I heard that you were, they wrote an article about you in the newsletter about the ham radio club. And he said, yeah. He goes, well, listen, you know, I'm, I'm in the nursing home. I can't see him. I'm in the wheelchair. And uh, when I heard about that, I thought this was a great idea. But, but I used to be a ham radio operator, but I let my license lapse. And he goes, well, when did it lapse? And it was like 1931. <laughs> so Grant says, we're going to get that license renewed, and we're going to get you over there. And sure enough, the, this blind guy in a wheelchair now is, think about ham radio. I mean, it's perfect for him. He's talking to people all over the world. And the ham radio is a, the emergency response uh, system for the county. So, I mean, again, I'm just trying to throw out some examples for you to just think about how you can think outside the box. So, there's my lady again. My, my most recent project, and, and this will hopefully kind of whet your appetite, is the, these, um, these two ladies right here are Olympic bronze medal soccer players. They, they played for the Canadian national team. And, uh, women's professional soccer players don't make any money at all. All right. They um, so when they when in Washington we have this women's professional soccer team. These ladies have to live in somebody's basement like an exchange student. Well, because <coughs> these two ladies had bronze medals, their uh, their their contract said uh, it says I, I can really have a lot of fun with this. <laughs> The, uh, um, they, their contract said that they couldn't live in a hotel. And general manager uh, got a hold of me and uh, heard that I was sort of thinking outside the box on stuff. And we were able, this past season, these two uh, soccer players lived in a retirement community. And um, it was awesome because the residents of the community got to go watch all their soccer games. And then they would have fan nights at the retirement community and, um, you know, girls are coming in and getting their soccer ball signed. So, you know, the, my goal is, is just color outside the lines. I think the team at All-American, it's a great team to work with. Um, you know, brainstorm with them on different ways that you can make this community uh, fit you and your loved ones and get the community involved. The best, the, the coolest thing, the thing that I, that I don't like about what happens to senior living communities in, um, in neighborhoods is, is that we don't look at it as another home on the block. We look at it as a facility, okay? And what I want to see happen is that this is just another home on the block, you know? And, and that, you guys can all play a really big role in that.